Okay, well, uh, hello and uh, welcome everybody uh, attending our webinar on um, Asia after COVID-19. And uh, good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, my name is Tim Oaks. I'm the director of the Center for Asian Studies uh, here at University of Colorado at Boulder. And it is uh, really my pleasure to welcome you all and to welcome our panelists and to thank them for um, joining us from various corners of East and Southeast Asia um, to talk a little bit about and enlighten us about the, the situation with COVID-19 there and, and uh, just a little bit of an overview. Um, uh, just a couple things that I wanted to say before we, we jump into it. Um, and that is to say that COVID-19, um, to say that COVID-19 has changed the world is by now uh, a real understatement. <laughs> And, um, but whether or not it has changed the world irrevocably or simply, um, or simply a temporary situation of the world being put on pause uh, remains to be seen. But already it seems clear that certain aspects of our lives will probably not return to the way they were before the crisis stage of the panic, uh, pandemic has ended. Or after I should say the crisis stage of the pandemic has ended. Uh, while we here in the United States um, uh, have seen no shortage of discussion and debate regarding what is the new normal uh, going to look like at, in the coming months and years. Um, we at the Center for Asian Studies felt like it would be useful to hear from some Asia-based voices regarding what sort of long and short-term impacts uh, of COVID-19 might there be in particular places. Uh, what in short are the new normals that people are anticipating um, in Asia? Today we'll hear from four guests, two based in East Asia and two in Southeast Asia. Uh, we're hoping to host a follow-up webinar later in the summer with more of a South and Southwest Asia focus um, on this issue. So please look for details regarding that um, sometime soon. Our guests are academics, writers, journalists, um, and we hope that they can provide us with a diversity of regional and um, topical perspectives, and I'm sure, I'm sure they will. So let me just introduce really quickly um, who we'll be hearing from in order that they'll also be giving their um, presentations. Uh, Michael Batikiotis is a Singapore-based writer and journalist. He's the author of many books and articles, most recently, Blood and Silk, Power and Conflict in Modern Southeast Asia. He currently heads the Asia program of the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. Uh, we will then hear from Yang Yang, uh, a postdoctoral fellow at the Asia Research Institute at the National University of Singapore. Uh, her research looks at transnational Islamic networks between China and Southeast Asia. Uh, and I'd also like to add that Dr. Yang got her PhD in geography here from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, and then we will hear from uh, Ben Dooley, who reports on Japan's business and economics, uh, business and economy for the New York Times. Uh, he has covered Asia for nearly a decade, starting as a reporter in Washington and Beijing for Japan's Kyoto News before later joining the AFP in China. Mm -hmm. And then last but not least, we will hear from Jin Wan Oh, who is Associate Professor of International Studies at AY Women's University uh, in Seoul and also uh, has been a visiting scholar here at the Center for Asian Studies. Uh, he previously taught at the International University in Japan and received his PhD in regional science from Cornell University. So welcome all panelists. Uh, I will now turn things over to you, Michael, and we will get going. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, it's great to be here and um, uh, I wanted to focus this morning a little bit on the uh, overall situation in Southeast Asia, where I'm living in Singapore, um, and uh, look a little bit ahead at uh, the likely fallout um, from the global pandemic. Um, it's a little bit strange for me, perhaps, um, because if I look back on my 35-year uh, career in Southeast Asia, there was a very similar event or at least seemingly similar event that occurred when i was living in thailand in the mid 19 in the late 1990s there was a 
what we call the Asian financial crisis. And, and the reason I raise it is because at the time it was, uh, and I was also actually living in, in Hong Kong when the SARS uh, uh, epidemic um, gripped the, the region as well. And they were sort of, at the time, they seemed to be um, similarly uh, cataclysmic events. Uh, you had the collapse of Asian currencies in the late 1990s, um, which felled, you know, seemingly healthy economies um, and affected society greatly. And also in 2002, 2003, you had a similar virus um, that brought um, much of uh, Southeast Asia and uh, China and uh, in particular to a, a standstill, um, although not to the same degree that we see today. So th these are my points of, of reference. Um, the overall situation in Southeast Asia, of course, um, has not been nearly as uh, severe in terms of COVID-19 uh, as parts of uh, Europe and the United States uh, and indeed Latin America. Um, and in, even now, as we see um, the virus taking hold of parts of Africa, um, Southeast Asia uh, has had fewer than 160,000 cases to date. Um, and fewer than 4,000 deaths. Um, so it's a relatively light impact. But of course, the major impact has been uh, the shutdown of a region that has always been um, a, a transitory, uh, a, a transit point for trade. Um, countries that in the last 30 years have interacted with the world and with each other um, using the um, means of trade and travel, um, movement of labor. Um, the economies are growing more and more dependent on service and retail sector, on trade, on, tra on travel and, and tourism, uh, which has been completely shut down. Um, and so the economic impact is severe. Um, I want to focus uh, today a little bit on the impact of the pandemic uh, and the lockdown measures on two aspects uh, of the region and then look a little bit ahead. Um, first of all, on democratic governments, democracy um, in the region and also um, uh, on conflict, which is the business that, uh, that I'm involved in today uh, with the Center of Humanitarian Dialogue. Um, the first thing to say about the impact on, on the political situation is that broadly speaking, government responses to the pandemic have utilized the tools of top-down authoritarian rule, uh, which to me indicates, um, unsurprisingly, the inherent weakness of democratic rule and the frailty of civilian supremacy over the military in, in across much of Southeast Asia. We saw that Indonesia turned to the military to lead on managing the crisis, appointing senior former military officers uh, and uh, some active military officers to manage the crisis task force and utilizing troops to enforce lockdowns and health measures. This reflects the, the still the very important role played by the military as a backup to um, uh, government and, and both in security and basic uh, service delivery uh, across the country. It's a reality that has been the case in Indonesia for decades that um, despite stepping back from politics after the late 1990s, the military remains a very important, very efficient institution. Um, and just before the pandemic hit, um, there were plans to, to seed surplus officers um, into the bureaucracy to boost the um, effectiveness of government and also address a serious problem of overcapacity in the military. And I think we've also seen with President Joko Widodo um, a reliance on the, uh, the military uh, in terms of former military officers um, as opposed to uh, civilian technocrats. Thailand used emergency decrees backed by military power, unsurprisingly, since uh, their last coup in 2014, um, you've had a, a junta-led government and even after the elections in 2019, last year, um, that same government more or less remains in power. In Myanmar, the crisis response was also led by the military, um, unsurprisingly. Um, and in the Philippines, 
uh, President Duterte uh, all but threatened declaring martial law as a way of um, dealing with the, the crisis and deployed the military to enforce the lockdown. Now, I don't want to overstate the case, but I just think it, 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 it is a bit of a setback for the region because there has been some progress towards civilian supremacy in the security field and also in government. But I think this crisis has underlined and underscored the utility of the military as a, as a source of stability um, in, <clears throat> in Southeast Asia. In some countries like Malaysia and Thailand, the lockdown has also been used to keep a lid on protests and delay democratic accountability. The Malaysian parliament has not met properly since March. Um, there had been this strange transition to a new government um, and um, the opposition uh, probably has a majority in the parliament, uh, but the government has used the pandemic as an excuse to prevent the a proper sitting of parliament so a vote of no confidence a vote of no confidence can be held and of course thailand has delayed lifting emergency decrees despite the steep decline uh, in reported cases of covid-19 because it does worry that there will be popular protests governments around the region are fearful that the massive unemployment and failure to organize um, uh, adequate social safety nets will unleash protests and, and, and instability. Thailand has seen um, a record 8 million Thais unemployed um, since uh, April. Um, all the governments of the region have uh, quickly moved to uh, introduce um, uh, schemes for of social safety nets um, to uh, bolster um, businesses and, and, and provide uh, relief. Um, in, in all the region, in all the countries of the region, these schemes have been hastily prepared, not very well implemented, and most people have not received the assistance um, they need. The worst hit sectors of society, of course, are migrants, the urban poor, and the majority of the workforce in Southeast Asia engaged in the real or informal sector of the economy, which in the case of Indonesia represents about 60% of the workforce. Strangely um, and uh, optimistically, one can see that there's been uh, in recent months, in recent weeks, uh, something of a pushback evident um, on the back of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, um, which has given uh, a lot of impetus to NGOs and civil society to advocate for equal rights, greater tolerance, and even in the case of the Philippines um, and Thailand um, on human rights. And so this was a, a bit of a surprising development, but it, I think historically developments in the United States, um, if you go back to the third wave of democratic change to the 1960s and 70s, have always had an outsized influence um, on, on political currents and social movements in, in across the world and, and, and therefore also in Southeast Asia. Very quickly, as far as conflict is concerned, I think while there were initially some very promising signs of ceasefires and the subnational conflicts that affect Southeast Asia, um, unilateral ceasefires were declared, in fact, um, by um, ethnic armed, armed ethnic negotiations in uh, Myanmar, in southern Thailand, um, and in Papua. Um, and in the Philippines, the long-running uh, communist insurgency um, and the Philippine government jointly declared a ceasefire early on in response to the UN Secretary General's global appeal. Um, sadly, the only ceasefire that has really held is in southern Thailand, where there's been no violence perpetrated by BRN, the only effective insurgent group uh, in southern Thailand since April. Unfortunately, in Myanmar, the government refused to reciprocate um, and fierce fighting has continued uh, in Rakhine State uh, on the western side of the country um, where the Arakan army um, is battling government troops and sadly more than 160,000 people have been made homeless. In Papua, uh, in Indonesia, the government did not respond to the OPM's offer of a ceasefire and in the Philippines, the government um, abrogated the ceasefire uh, soon after it was declared and has gone on an aggressive campaign to hunt down uh, communist insurgents. Um, the reason why I say in a way it's been good for conflict because on the one hand you have had some effort to 
introduced ceasefires, but on the other hand, the conflicts have also uh, rumbled on uh, without much impact um, from COVID-19. They are often in marginal areas, uh, rural populations not, not badly affected. I think that was initially the case, but of course now we're seeing um, the, the virus impact areas um, that were formerly not impacted. Um, for instance, in the Philippines, you're having the return of thousands and thousands of migrant workers um, who will bring back the, the virus to areas, uh, remote areas of the southern Philippines, for instance. In Myanmar, migrant workers are carrying the virus back from, from Thailand. Um, and so I think we're going to see the long uh, rolling out of uh, the impact of COVID-19 in areas that maybe weren't formally affected. I'll just end by saying that if we look forward uh, to the, the after effects. I'm, I'm worried about the, the, the political and, and uh, economic impact this will have on Southeast Asia in terms of um, impacting um, the, the tremendous progress that was made politically in places like Indonesia, uh, in Malaysia, uh, and in, uh, even in Thailand, uh, where there was a sort of slow recovery um, of uh, a polarized conflict situation over the last decade. Um, I think we will see politicians uh, take advantage uh, of the performance of governments, um, which has been largely poor across the region, with a few exceptions. I think Singapore and Malaysia have done quite well, um, where you have strong civil services that have been able to cope, um, and uh, doctors and medical services that have that provided uh, adequate information and good uh, health care. But across uh, Myanmar, Thailand, um, and Indonesia and the Philippines, um, there will be political um, fallout. Vietnam, of course, is the great outlier in all this, fewer than 400 cases and no deaths. Also Laos and Cambodia. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, uh, we'll see uh, Thailand, the Philippines, uh, Myanmar, uh, and Indonesia most affected. And the worrying thing, of course, is that on top of all the identity politics that has created conflict and tension in society, um, we'll see a tremendous impact from uh, rising inequality um, and, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the medium term, uh, which is already a huge problem in Southeast Asia. Uh, Thailand, for instance, 80% of GDP, uh, household debt represents 80% of, of, uh, of GDP. Um, and uh, it's it's very, very, very serious problem uh, across many of the economies that have not been able to provide a sufficient or fair distribution of income uh, from the fruits of development. So looking ahead, political impact, uh, severe economic inequality that will compound existing tensions uh, in these societies. I'll leave it there. Great, thank you so much, Michael, for providing that uh, over uh, uh, a real kind of regional overview from Southeast Asia. That's very helpful. Uh, we will turn things over now to Yang Yang. All right, so thank you very much, Tim. And, and again, thanks very much to the Center for Asian Studies to uh, give me this opportunity to share uh, my thoughts on the um, on the, um, on the, uh, what's gonna, well, the kind of a perspective or, or, or what's gonna happen after the COVID-19. Uh, so, and so given that Michael has already shared, has already shared his insights about this kind of a regional overview, I'm going to dive into the specific aspects about the migrant laborers, specifically in relation to the economic development and also society at large in Singapore. So I'm going to do a screen share here. Can you see it? Okay, so I'm going to uh, direct, I'm going to skip a couple of slides and directly move on to my, to the key topics. So as you can see here, um, so as you can see here, the kind of building that you would, you will, it will be easily identified in the lens, landscape of Singapore, those densely packed dormitories that are constructed near uh, near factories and in areas that are that are remotely uh, 
that are remotely different from residential and other commercial areas. And within those buildings, as you can see, you will see that say migrant workers, primarily men, uh, many of them from China, India, uh, Bangladesh, uh, 12 to 20 of them, uh, they, they share one room and, and also share the bathroom. And then so this kind of a highly dense living and not to mention working conditions somehow has triggered the has somehow has triggered the issue of has has somehow has turned has has shifted direction of the uh, of COVID-19 in Singapore because initially Singapore was celebrated as as the kind of role model in treating the in treating in in dealing with the situation for COVID-19, everything was under control until the point that oh, all of a sudden there's this this, this explosion of the cases uh, in in migrant in migrant labor storms. So that actually, on the one hand, it, it shows that it, on the on the one hand, it it, it is a it, it is a major issue especially in the in the context of COVID in Singapore. However, it also brought up this long-term issue about the situation of migrant workers in Singapore. So first of all, let me give you some statistics. So there are roughly about three, 323,000 uh, migrant laborers living, migrant, migrant men uh, living in 20 plus something dorms in Singapore. So during roughly during May, when Singapore was in the so-called circuit breaker period, uh, those storms were identified as isolation areas, meaning that there are a large number of cases. And then, and, and then one, of the, uh, one, of, one of the approaches taken by the Singaporean government by then was to uh, prevent, the, prevent migrant workers from coming out of those isolation zones so that the community, AKA the, the areas outside the the areas outside the outside the dorms areas won't be won't be infected. That's why um, that's why you can see on the left hand uh, on the left hand of the slide uh, in the government WhatsApp messages you will normally see you will normally see this kind of uh, differentiation between the cases. So for example, you will see a majority of work permit holders re residing in foreign work dormitories. Here, work permit holders meaning uh, migrant workers. Uh, who are on contract or who uh, who paid a lot of money uh, to the agent in order to come to Singapore to fill up jobs that wouldn't be wouldn't be taken up by locals such as construction, domestic helpers, retail, and uh, and also hospitality, those kind of things. And then so and then so many of them. And then you might be wondering, what about women? Because uh, the, the majority of the women, uh, so female migrant workers, uh, many of them, they are domestic workers, so they live in the families they work for. However, that also, it doesn't mean that they have, they're in a better situation. There are similar cases that we can discuss more later in the Q&A. So, um, so you might be thinking, okay, so the migrant workers in Singapore, their dorms became their dorms be, their dorms became the hotbed for uh, for for COVID nineteen cases. What kind of long term impact is going to have because of this issue, and then because of the attention given not only by the government but also by the society to change the life, to change the living condition of of the of the migrant workers. One of the things I can see is going to happen is. This long-term Singapore's long-standing economic economic growth model is going to be changed. Uh, what I mean by it is that this heavily this model of heavily relying on transient foreign labor at all levels of uh, at, at all levels of labor force will be changed. And then you might be you might be wondering why this is mostly because. Because before COVID-19, if you look at the, if you look at the, let's say the, the, the condition of the dorms and also look at the average uh, wage level, uh, average wage level in uh, among the migrant workers in Singapore, um, for business owners and then uh, for factory owners, business owners, it's, I hate to put it in that way, but it's relatively quote unquote cheaper to maintain this. So they don't really have to put in a lot of money to uh, to cover the part of the uh, lodging and also the um, and and also the uh, and also the other parts of the other parts of the migrant workers package such, such as healthcare. However, given the given the COVID nineteen 
and then uh, so first of all the first thing that you would the first thing needs to be changed will be for example social distancing since that would be the new norm and that would be the new norm after COVID, well from now on and then there is no way for let's say 12 to 20 20 migrant workers to be packed in that in that room so if you do the math and then the number of rooms will be will be increased and then and then on top of that um there's also there's also this concern that uh, this and also there's another there's another trend which is also related to the kind of the re regional economic uh, impacts is that um, uh, given that uh, in the foreseeable future the regional economy and also the economy in Singapore will will significantly slow down overall and the meaning that the amount of labor demanded will also be be slowed down and not to mention that because of the increased cost of labor. There are there are ongoing discussions and discussions and then ongoing proposals about the kind of a technological replacement and alternatives to replace the amount of labor that need to be dependent on. So you so things you can think about include automation and remote working choices, which will make the situation much more difficult for migrant workers who are, for example, currently in Singapore and, and then also in need of jobs uh, during and after COVID-19. So, um, and of course, the, um, the kind of trend towards shifting towards the, uh, te the technological replacement can also be seen in the, uh, in the landscape of research, research grants. So, uh, so at least uh, you will see at least you will see circulated amount the academic communities uh, their grants and call for call for proposals to uh, to ask academics to come up with kind of a talk technological projects and then technological solutions to do with uh, not just you know the shortage of labor during the COVID-19 but also beyond that and let's see Can I ask the time? Because sorry, I lost track of my time. Uh, okay, all right. Okay, I think I'll wrap it up here and I'm happy to talk more later uh, after, during the Q&A, thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you, Yang, for uh, giving us that perspective on uh, migrant worker situation um, I think you need to unshare your screen. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, stop sharing. There we go. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for that. And uh, hopefully we have more time to get some more details about that. Um, we will now, let's go to Ben Dooley, who is joining us from Tokyo, I think. Yes, Tokyo. Hi, morning. Uh, thanks for, and, uh, good morning. Glad thanks for having you. me here today. Um, so I am currently in Tokyo. I've been here for about a year and a half with the New York Times as a correspondent, mostly covering, covering business and the economy. And um, we've, of course, been watching COVID very carefully since the beginning. And Japan was uh, one of the first countries to be really affected outside of China by COVID. Um, so I'm just going to quickly run through sort of the timeline of events here and the situation currently, and then uh, talk a little bit about uh, what I see as some potential uh, short-term, long-term effects. Um, so, COVID first arrived in Japan in mid-January um, from China. Of course, uh, China and Japan have uh, a lot of business links, uh, as, as do so many countries these days. Um, and the virus arrived from Wuhan, probably um, from people who were going back and forth working for auto manufacturers, those kinds of businesses. Um, by early February, we had the Diamond Princess here, which was the cruise ship in uh, Yokohama, which became the site of the second largest uh, cluster of coronavirus infections outside of China and drew a lot of global attention to Japan. Um, and also sort of was a wake up call, I guess, for the country to a certain extent. Um, people domestically became very aware of uh, the virus. And I think there was a lot more concern about the virus in Japan uh, probably earlier on than in, in other countries. 
Um, by the end of February, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe had already moved to close the Japanese school system. Um, that became one, Japan became one of the first countries to do that. And that sort of, again, raised the alert level in Japan pretty significantly. Um, by mid-March, Japan had begun to close its borders to other um, to people traveling from other parts of the world. Uh, by mid-April, Tokyo was on, uh, sorry, early April, Tokyo was on, uh, is shifted to a state of emergency. And the government was calling for people to uh, reduce their person-to-person -person contacts by 80% for businesses to close, et cetera. Um, we entered sort of a, a light lockdown at that point. Uh, we quick, quickly shifted to a state of national emergencies. Country, so businesses across the country closed. Uh, Tokyo essentially became uh, a, a ghost town. Uh, I've been in, sort of locked in my apartment for, uh, not locked, I use the term loosely, but uh, staying in my apartment for uh, the better part of a month and a half now. Um, the country moved out of its state of emergency at the end of May. And uh, things have surprisingly returned to something approaching normal. Um, one of the biggest changes is that Japan has basically stopped the entrance of all foreign nationals into the country. Um, I think that in April, we saw only a few thousand people come from outside of Japan into the country. Um, and that's had a pretty profound effect on the city, as you can imagine, uh, when you go to many of the areas that were popular with Chinese tourists. As of February, I think we had, um, sorry, January, I think we had about a, a million people coming to Tokyo, visiting Tokyo um, from outside the country. And uh, this month, again, it's just a few thousand people. So when you go around the city, you visit Harajuku or Ginza, the areas that are very popular with tourists, I mean, they're still largely abandoned. Um, now, Japan has fared it's interesting, much like other countries in the region, Japan has fared comparatively well. Um, it hasn't seen anything approaching the number of deaths or cases that we've seen in Europe or the Americas. We've had fewer than a thousand deaths in Japan and uh, I think just under 18,000 cases, uh, reported cases of coronavirus as of today. Um, having said that, it's still behind uh, many of its peer countries in the region. So although, although it has performed uh, very well, um, its uh, per capita mortality is significantly higher than um, South Korea, for example, or uh, China, Taiwan. Um, and it's also true for the countries in uh, the South Pacific, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera. Um, that the reasons for the su that success has become sort of uh, the subject of a fairly intense debate here. The government, of course, says it's uh, due to its policies. Um, the main sort of innovation, I guess, was this idea of the three C's, which was reducing, um, keeping people away from closed spaces, crowded spaces, and close contact with others. And uh, their experience with the Diamond Princess, which was sort of considered a debacle um, because of how quickly the virus spread through the cruise ship, became the basis for, I think, of what's been a fairly successful uh, prevention strategy here. Um, they've also emphasized um, what they call cluster management, which is just identifying areas where the disease has spread quickly and sort of locking them down by uh, doing contact tracing, putting people in quarantine. Um, and, but they've eschewed this kind of broader testing that has been recommended by the WHO and has been pursued in other countries like China or South Korea. So I think on average um, now we have about 12,000 tests a day or uh, we're having about 12,000 tests a day through the national emergency in April. Uh, we have a capacity of like 24,000 tests a day. So you contrast that to uh, China which was testing I think the same number of people in Wuhan. Uh, they, I think China tested the same number of people in Wuhan in one day as Japan tested during the entire pandemic so far. Um, so it's really unclear why it's been so successful, but um, I think most of the experts here sort of cited uh, the high use of masks. Mask use was very prevalent in Japan before, even before the uh, pandemic, and also uh, voluntary social distancing. As I said, there was no government-imposed lockdown, uh, unlike other places, uh, other countries. Japan doesn't have the authority 
to uh, force people to stop their activities or stay at home, um, which has become an issue, was a topic of hot discussion here uh, in, in early March when uh, the Abe administration was pushing for a constitutional reform that would allow it to declare national emergencies and, and take on some of those powers, although the need for that quickly dissipated um, since the disaster never reached um, the kind of levels that people were concerned it might. Um, so how is it changing the country? Uh, I think the changes probably are fairly similar in some respects to what's happening in other countries, um, other developed countries. We have, um, or more advanced economies, I guess. Uh, we've seen an acceleration of certain trends that were already kind of in train, but hadn't uh, made much progress. Uh, one big thing, of course, is digitalization of public and the private sphere. Um, so we've seen a big move by companies to teleworking. Um, that was something that had been promoted ahead of the 20, 2020 Olympics, which of course had been moved to next year, but hadn't really caught on. This has sort of forced companies to move a lot of their operations online and forced the government to uh, change its processes, which were almost entirely paper-based in, in many situations to more of an online model. Um, and it's also encouraged people to participate more uh, online. We've seen more citizen engagement online as people have been staying home. They've had more time to get on Twitter. Um, and they've been sort of, as a result, more involved, I would say more, more vocal, vocal or visibly involved in uh, domestic politics. Um, and uh, the big example was um, uh, opposition to uh, Prime Minister Abe's move to uh, extend term limits for prosecutors here that caused a huge public uproar, and I think in a, a way uh, that we wouldn't have seen maybe a, a year ago. Uh, the other big change, and again, I think we're seeing this in other countries as well, is um, it's accelerated the change in China's, uh, sorry, Japan's relationship with China. Um, this is just, there's been, you know, almost a 180 uh, in the last year or two, and partly that's because, of course, changing political dynamics within China itself, um, Hong Kong, uh, the oppression of Uyghurs in, in the far west. Um, but, it, you know, the pandemic has, has also played a big role here. Um, We've seen the Japanese government calling for Japanese companies to move their supply chains out of China. Um, and they have made a fair amount of money available for that in the re recent stimulus package. Although there hasn't, uh, I think J Japanese companies are still hesitant to, to um, em embrace the idea of moving their supply chains because there aren't many good options for them outside of China yet. Although we've seen some move to Vietnam and uh, to other parts of Southeast Asia. Um, and yeah, the, in addition to that, we've seen sort of just a general hardening, I guess, of Japan's views on China. Um, the, there was sort of a, after 2012, uh, when the, there, the dispute over the Senkaku or the Diyayu Islands had, had heated up, um, there was a real effort to improve relations and, and that's just uh, turned around. Uh, Xi Jinping was meant to visit here in April. That visit was obviously canceled because of the pandemic and there's a lot of pressure now on Prime Minister Abe to, to disinvite uh, Xi Jinping. And um, of course, we'll see what happens. I see I'm out of time, so I'm just gonna stop there for now, but I, I have, for those who are interested, more to say about the, the relationship with China. But yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Ben. Uh, that's great. And um, yeah, hopefully we do have some more time. Um, I, I'd personally particularly be uh, interested to hear more about um, what's been going on with Japan-China relations. And um, I think that's also something that um, I think all our panelists might also be thinking about um, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, since we, we are hearing from other, other regions of Asia bes uh, besides China and um, what uh, some of the China relations uh, with uh, these different places might be. So hopefully we'll have a chance to talk more about that. And uh, let me now just uh, turn things over to uh, Jin Huan. Um, floor is yours. Okay, um, thanks for having me. And um, it's my great pleasure to be a part of this panel and uh, thanks team and class for organizing this event. 
And regarding the situation in South Korea, uh, I'd like to share my uh, personal experience. I also like to uh, talk about some changes uh, that I'm observing in this country, as well as some ex uh, external relations. Um, I, I was staying in Boulder and I departed the Boulder, Colorado on June 6th, uh, together with my family and arrived in South Korea on the following day. And um, as soon as I arrived at the airport, I observed many interesting things. Uh, first, I found that there are a series of the several steps of uh, managing incoming traffic from the overseas, uh, any, any other countries known as 3T. So Ben previously mentioned it's 3C in Japan, but we now have a 3T trace test and uh, treatment. So anyone um, enters uh, the country, whether they're Korean or not, they all should install the mobile application and uh, through which I need to report the twice a day the, uh, to, the, to the office, to the authority that I'm actually staying home and my pen purchases is normal, things like that. So, um, so this, is, this, is, uh, this is actually the, the app that's so it's here, is check uh, the temperature and uh, that goes to the authorities, something like this. So anyway, um, at the airport, uh, the people cr uh, coming from the overseas are not allowed to take any uh, bus or like a metro public transportation. So in my case, uh, a vehicle was arranged by my city uh, government, the office, and, and that took me, uh, me and my family directly to the local health clinic for the COVID testing. So we, we all did that. And then uh, they uh, write uh, us home. And since then I started a two week, a very strict it's a quarantine and um, I'm still in the middle of quarantine. And luckily I got uh, negative in the test. And uh, so when this uh, two week period is over, which is, uh, this coming Sunday, I'm, I'm good to go out. I'm looking really forward to it. The thing is that uh, if someone is confirmed positive in the testing, then the government informed the public where the patients uh, have been uh, before they had been confirmed positive. So that kind of uh, the information revealing might be a, a conflict between the, the privacy rights and the public's uh, right to know about their health issues and check whether they cross path with the confirmed patients and decide uh, for themselves if they need to, to get tested or not. So in this country, I think uh, there seems to be a, a consensus or invisible agreement at least that the, uh, the public's right to know is uh, more important than the privacy right. So this kind of agreement, I mean, it's actually, I think is from this, uh, those uh, so-called the collective memory, uh, as the team mentioned in his previous uh, email and the recent epidemic in Five years ago, in 2015, uh, we had a MERS outbreak, a Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome. That outbreak lasted about the three months around this time, June. So um, I remember I was here at the time. It didn't affect that many people, about less than 100 people, but uh, it was very fatal. So the government learned a lot at the time that the importance of this uh, being prepared and preemptive. And people also seem to agree since that time that those kind of a tracing and testing it's very important to minimize the further spread of the virus and preserve the freedom of movement of the rest of the society. So in fact, uh, there has been no lockdown or any kinds of community quarantine or shutdown, restaurant, anything like that since uh, the COVID uh, the outbreak in South Korea. Uh, everything was a normal, I mean, with uh, so, uh, some, some small uh, this, um, social distancing, but still things have stabilized and with uh, less than 40, 50, per daily uh, the, the, um, the confirmed case. There's some small scale outbreaks uh, every day, but uh, things are I mean, it is mean, uh, within the manageable range. And regarding the changes I'm observing now, I'd like to focus on two things. So one domestic and one more uh, in, uh, international. For domestic part, um, some, as a person who is teaching in, in a college and also as a father of uh, three kids who all go to elementary school, I uh, am interested in uh, to see the the changes in education part. So in South Korea, the primary and secondary schools, I mean, from elementary to high school, were supposed to open in March. I mean, like in Japan, they're supposed to open in April, but in South Korea, it's in March. And uh, the government uh, kept postponing, but finally opened them uh, this month, uh, three months after they were supposed to open. But still, 100% the, the opening is, is more like an online, offline the, the mixture. The students go to school once a week or twice a week, depending on the school districts with all precautions of wearing masks all day and uh, these uh, glass screens around the desk and uh, temperature checks. So the rest of them, uh, education is supplemented by online the, the learning. So I think in the long term, this kind of um, online offline the mixture blended learning, even at the primary level, will be a so-called new normal. I mean, 
in, in university level is already being done, but in the, uh, the young students' primary schools, still, I think this, is, this will happen. This is happening not only in South Korea, but in many parts of the world, I, 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 as far as I know. My kids used to go to the neighborhood school in Boulder, Boulder Valley School District, and they also announced phase one to five. One is the completely online phase, completely offline. But um, in academic year 2021, it seems there's most likely somewhere in between online and offline, the blended one. So we may, um, I mean, COVID will be gone, but uh, even if it's gone, we may face another epidemic or pandemic. The so risk is always there. So I mean, it seems that people are learning how to live wisely with the, with the risk. And so these are uh, online, offline, the more and more is online things, um, not only in education, but also in many other fields. I mean, healthcare sectors as well. South Korea is very, very conservative in healthcare sectors. So we have to go to hospital to see doctors, but things are changing. So we are accepting more and more like telemedicine or like remote healthcare. It's also very different as uh, so new changes. And even in, uh, in sports, what is very interesting is that, um, so I'm a big fan of the baseball. So I, I was very happy to see that, that the baseball is running in South Korea. And uh, so very interestingly, I mean, as you may heard that, that no one is allowed to watch the game in the stadium. And it's, it's a completely empty stadium that simply that they keep uh, playing baseball. And um, so that could be kind of as a new normal. And um, I don't know, I mean, I don't really like that things, but so that, that might happen in the, in the future. So I, I was also wondering that whether that kind of a new normal might it's affect this at Tokyo Olympic 2021 actually. So maybe then, then can follow more on this too. Um, internationally, uh, this COVID-19 is uh, reversing the trend of globalization, as you all know, this uh, interaction between countries. So movements of goods and services across borders, international trade has dropped a lot. And movement of people, I mean, tourists, migrants, also all dropped significantly. It's quite difficult for a people like me, a South Korean person, to, to travel Japan, China, Southeast Asia. I mean, entries denied and a visa is being canceled, flight canceled, and two week quarantine in that country and another two week quarantine after coming back, things like this. So this kind of difficulty of movement, uh, the goods and services and people is unprecedented and this not only economic challenges, but also can be very serious diplomatic and security challenges. So regarding this uh, security, as Ben mentioned, there's some tensions between countries in uh, Japan and China also US and China, I mean, all this uh, in the region. And uh, we recently experienced this kind of bombing issue, I mean, blow up about the building with from the bomb from North Korea. And that kind of uh, things might not be directly relate, related with the COVID-19, but in broader sense can be understood in the, the tension between these uh, those countries in the region. So let me stop for now and uh, maybe I can continue in more during the session. Uh, thank you so much, Jin Wan. That's great. And uh, thank you all for um, keeping your comments brief. That gives us a lot of time to, um, to have discussion, uh, address questions that are coming in from, uh, from the audience. Um, uh, some, of, uh, some of our panelists are, have been quite efficient and <laughs> have already answered um, uh, several of the questions that have come in, um, hopefully those of you in the uh, audience can see the answers that are also have been typed by some of the panelists um, to some of the questions. Um, but some of them, some of the questions still remain um, open. And so what I will do at this point is just go through um, the questions as they come in on my list. Um, some of them have been directed at specific people, those who are not um, directed at anyone in particular, I will just let you all decide or whoever wants to jump in first <laughs> um, to address these, uh, go right ahead. And I'm just going to um, start at the top of the list. Also, um, be just before we get started on the Q&A, just a reminder, and hopefully um, you can all see in the chat, chat message, um, the way that we're uh, the way that we're doing the the, the questions. Um, so the first uh, first question comes in on um, how do you see the flows of foreign direct investment uh, in Asia, particularly in Southeast Asia? Uh, which country will emerge as the new economic power as we as we go forward? I guess I will direct this one to Michael first. 
Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, uh, as I ended my presentation or started my presentation as drawing that comparison uh, uh, with the Asian financial crisis of 1997, where recovery across the region was very, very swift. And that was partly, of course, because the rest of the world wasn't so badly affected. And so investment came back very quickly from overseas. Um, this is obviously not going to be the case this time. Um, having said that, um, many of the economies of, of Southeast Asia in particular um, have, of course, developed their own domestic uh, robustness, uh, are less reliant on overseas um, investment. Indonesia's economy, for instance, can tick along at 4 to 5% uh, GDP uh, growth simply on the basis of the domestic uh, economic output um, and market. Um, Thailand perhaps uh, relies more on tourism, um, where about 20% of the economy is dependent on foreign tourists. Um, and so that will be a country that, is, uh, that will be more vulnerable. Um, I think generally uh, one of the silver linings could be that there is greater regional uh, integration because uh, I think one of the, the, ph the phenomena of the global pandemic is that the world is no longer um, uh, so well connected. Um, and I think what we're going to see initially in, in at least Southeast Asia and maybe between China and Southeast Asia, Japan and Southeast Asia, is a return to uh, more regional flows uh, of trade uh, and investment. Particularly, there's an opportunity there for Japan and, of course, for China, which, of course, which is recovering uh, faster from the pandemic and therefore is in a position to take advantage of market opportunities, investment opportunities in other parts of Asia faster than other parts of the world. So I think um, I'm generally optimistic that you know, there will be a faster than expected recovery in some of these economies. Um, uh, but I'm also conscious of the fact that this is not like the 1997 financial crisis. The rest of the world has been badly affected. There will be a massive global depression. Um, and w Southeast Asia is particularly fortunate to have um, generally ro robust uh, reserves, uh, low levels of indebtedness, um, at, at least at the national level. Um, and you know uh, domestic economies and markets that can that can get going relatively quickly where migrant workers can return to work uh, where the informal sector will pick itself up reasonably quickly um, so I suppose on balance I'm optimistic that the recovery will still be faster than than we might expect mm. Michael just uh, if I could just follow up on that I mean uh, uh, one of the things that occurs to me as you were talking is whether or not um, you might see kind of regional travel bubbles <laughs> like uh, mm. what you know Australia and New Zealand have been trying to establish among themselves um, do you see that happening in Southeast Asia there are discussions underway on establishing what they call green lanes between countries. Uh, I think everyone wants to get back to business travel to and from China. Um, Singapore launched a green lane uh, arrangement uh, on the 8th of June, mainly uh, only for essential business travel. And I think across the region, we're going to see those kinds of arrangements put in place. The government here in Singapore is warning that there won't be uh, uh, recreational travel for some time to come you will have to prove that your travel is essential for business um, and uh, I think that's what we're going to see initially but that's not really going to happen to any great extent until next month in uh, July uh, and possibly even August. Yeah. Uh, do any of the other panelists want to jump in on this question about uh, foreign direct investment or um, if not we will move on. Okay, uh, we have a question from uh, Michael Zink about, uh, uh, you know, after COVID, um, this was, I think, one of the first questions that came in and, and it's also directed at Southeast Asia. Um, if we, you know, I think just a question to, to, uh, more, uh, more specific about if, if, if and when we get to a point where, the, where we don't have any COVID, um, what does that look like um, moving forward? And I, I guess I would also address this to, to Michael or Yang Yang. Why don't you go first, Yang Yang, and I'll, I'll follow up. 
okay, let me take a look at the question. So, so is that Michael Zink's question about what yeah, about after yeah, COVID? Just about, yeah. Wow, that's a, ooh. Huh. That's a great question, but it's also pretty hard to answer. I hate to say that, but um, so so I think Michael in his uh, in his um, in his uh, in his comments and also his his replies to some other questions that actually has already um, has already uh, shed light on some part of this 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 answer is basically you know the because of the regional economy has already been slowed down due to the COVID-19. So economic recovery will be one of the top primary, especially let's say for countries like Thailand and Singapore and Malaysia and other places where you know uh, tourism has been playing a big part. And then for example, in Singapore, that's say aviation, tourism, and then and aviation and tourism, these two are these are, these two are two key components of the of the local economy. Given these two sectors are com well are almost completely sh shutting down at this point, so uh, so for example, one of the things that the the, the Singapore government brought up uh, brought up as a, as part of the gradually opening up is is this idea that oh we're we're aiming for recovering tourism, we're aiming for. Uh, gradually opening up of aviation. So I think economic recovery will be something that is something that is you can probably see uh, in many Southeast Asian countries. But also I think it has to, but also I think another important thing that we need to think about in this region is to see the the kind of a political situations because of the uh, because of the uh, because of the virus and then protests and then all this kind of a political movements are uh, shutting down because of all those requirements. So maybe you will see a new wave of alternative forms of political movements, either being you know, online, either being on social media, or either being some other in a more, in, in, a, in a way that is allowed in the new norm, even though we don't really know what the new norm means yet, but maybe the new, nor the new normal, new normal will be a, political discourse that maybe the Southeast Asian governments will pick up to articulate whatever thing's going to happen. That's, that's how I see it. Yeah, well, that's an that's a, that's a optimistic response for um, possible, uh, possible more political pluralism. Based on what Michael was saying earlier, we might also have the, uh, the opposite of uh, less democracy. Yeah, that's true. More, more that's true. Michael, what, what would you like to add? Yeah, I, I think that's, a, just to pick up on Yang Yang's point, I think that's a very good um, uh, uh, point going forward, which is that we're seeing, of course, the, the impact of social media um, magnified by, by the COVID-19 uh, crisis. A lot of protests that would have taken place on the streets in places like Thailand uh, and Indonesia um, and even Myanmar are sort of moving online. Um, and uh, you know, Twitter is a very, very important medium in Thailand, um, and uh, protests uh, and social movements are emerging uh, on Twitter, um, Facebook in Myanmar, um, and uh, and in Indonesia, um, where there are huge numbers of people using these platforms. Um, it, there are good and bad aspects. That yes, I think in Thailand we're seeing uh, a, the development of some rather sort of um, strident. Uh, popular uh, opinion and protests developing in Indonesia. Uh, we're seeing, on the other hand, you know, very important community level action and uh, and collective um, uh, 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 sharing of information. So that there are good and bad aspects of it. I mean, across the Philippines, information is being shared uh, using uh, social media, um, and we're seeing people um, in a good way you know, making sure that uh, expert advice and uh, good health information is spread. Um, so I think coming out of it, and, and it is a very important question, and I don't think any of us have a very sort of clear answer of what the region will look like, but I do expect um, that existing political fault lines will come under some stress. Um, existing trends in terms of the uh, concerns about inequality, Concern, uh, you know, identity tensions between communities of ethnic and religious difference. Mm -hmm. These will 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 come under significant stress, and it really will be the task of strong leadership, effective leadership, and 
the resist, I mean, what we're seeing in the Philippines, for instance, is that the, the president is immediately turning to um, very strong authoritarian means to sort of make sure that uh, uh, almost taking advantage of the, of the pandemic, uh, that he has control of the political landscape, control of the military, um, uh, ahead of elections that are due in, in, in two years' time. Um, so we will see, on the one hand, uh, communities and civil society emerging more strongly, but on the other hand, those uh, inclined towards using more authoritarian means, uh, using those tools more effectively. So it's a mixed picture. Great. Thanks for that. Um, Let's move on. We have a question, um, a, a broader question about uh, from Alexa Brown about international education. Uh, how do you think COVID will impact international education in particular? Um, both students coming to the US from abroad, um, from Singapore, from Southeast Asia, from Japan, from South Korea, um, but also those who are seeking education abroad exchange experiences, um, you know, from the, from the United States to the countries that, that you are all in. Um, I, I, I'll leave this one open to anyone who, who wants to, uh, to jump in. Hmm. Um, I, I would say probably the biggest impact is going to be from Chinese students um, who will likely be staying home uh, instead of going to the US or the UK or Australia or any number of other countries where they might have been studying. Um, is, probably, you know, much better than, than I do. Um, you know, Chinese students have been uh, an important source of funding for uh, private universities in the US recently. And I think that there's probably going to be an upcoming crisis as a result of uh, those students either deciding they don't want to study in the US because of the way the country has handled the coronavirus outbreak, uh, perhaps they don't feel safe or, um, you know, due to rising tensions uh, between the U.S. and China that are, are related, I, I think that's going to be probably the largest impact. In Japan, um, I, I don't, the restrictions on travel obviously make a big difference moving forward. Uh, I think the number of Japanese students studying abroad has been de in decline for years now. I, I don't anticipate that this will make a big difference um, in their desire to, students desire to study abroad, but, um, you know, uh, does, does anybody think that uh, there would be more of a regional um, education abroad, you know, uh, so East Asian students not coming to the U.S. but um, remaining somewhere closer to home? Do you think that's more likely or not? Anybody? <laughs> Hard to say. Me. That's possible because I mean, maybe for some countries, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised that Singaporean universities will start, you know, promoting branding itself being like, hey, you actually don't need to go to go that far. You can just kind of uh, just coming here and studying at maybe NUS or somewhere else and then just to, you know, achieve the something similar. I don't know. But also, um, but also, you know, it's, um, you can think about it being maybe maybe i mean because ben you mentioned about you know chinese students because i'm one of those chinese students studying studying in the u.s so it's maybe people's perceptions are changing these days it doesn't necessarily have to be the u.s especially after the COVID, and also what's going on right now and then maybe parents are having second thoughts about going sending their kids to the u.s mm -hmm. i don't know yeah yeah yeah, but I think it all depends on the, the, the person and universities and uh, all these That's institutions. True. And uh, one of my students, uh, she got the uh, admission from one of the universities in the US. So she's happy to go there, but uh, it's quite hard to get visa in the embassy in Seoul. So yeah. it's a visa, it's all suspended things. So that kind of administrative things is a big issue. And another student, uh, she got admission from one university in UK, but she decided not to go because not because of these COVID things, but the universities all decide to, to make it online. So she thought it's kind of a, it's not cost effective things. So it all, I think all depends on case by case. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just add as well that the, the, the one thing that has been happening, you know, here in the U.S. is mm -hmm. that um, the forces who are, who have wanted to restrict immigration um, have been taking advantage of the pandemic to, to implement more extreme kind of restrictions and then 
wanting to maintain those um, uh, as we as we move forward rather than going back to um, things the way they were and there's there's a political fight going on about that obviously um, mm. and and as and as Ben mentions it you know it's it's quite specifically focused on Chinese students coming uh, coming to the US and and whether or not um, you know few more 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 students being denied visas fewer um, more restrictions and whether or not we'll ever get back to a point where we were not just prior to the pandemic but you know several years ago where we had much more of a high point in terms of um, of uh, Asian students coming to the US let's move on uh, we have a a, um, a question for Michael um, is the problem of the COVID spread such as in Indonesia due to inequality, political, military, as opposed to the inability to provide adequate testing? Um, I heard from a PBS report that Vietnam is also doing heavy handed style and successful, um, I think, uh, testing, but, but they also provided good, good testing. Um, how much testing was actually done in the countries you spoke about? Well, you know, that's a very good question because broadly speaking, of course, you know, a distinction has started to be made in many people, by many people looking at the different reactions to um, COVID-19 globally. In terms of um, the relationship between societies and their governments, and, you know, and I think uh, Kinwan Oh, we will we'll, we'll probably comment on the sort of South Korean experience being one where, you know, the South Korean people generally trust their government. And I think uh, Ben can maybe comment also on Japan. Um, I will speak from the perspective of Southeast Asia that, of course, you know, people generally have not trusted their governments. Um, having said that, you have societies that uh, are generally um, reasonably compliant. Uh, to government um, uh, regulations and Singapore being an extremely good example of that. I think Malaysia, uh, we've seen a, a nice balance between government effectiveness, the civil service, the, the medical, the, the, the chief medical officer of the government um, uh, has become almost a national hero in, in Malaysia. Uh, a team of doctors in Thailand who managed to wrestle back some of the um, decision making from the military about how to handle the crisis um, only because they were given, if you like, royal protection. Um, uh, we're seeing sort of uh, a, a mixture of, of good, uh, relatively good health advice, uh, compliant societies, and the ability of civil servants to um, somehow make sure that uh, information is spread. Um, so it's a mixed picture. Vietnam, of course, did test very extensively, was able to lock down large numbers of people in their communities. Um, so probably more than testing, it was the ability to order society to be compliant, um, mm. and therefore the, the, the virus didn't spread. Um, uh, you know, Singapore uh, has very carefully uh, tried to be candid and open with, the, with its people about the seriousness of the situation, uh, at the same time not wishing to alarm them um, and, you know, has succeeded, I think, in, in creating great public awareness of the dangers of the virus. Uh, Indonesia handled it really badly initially, you know, a, a combination of denial, um, the use of uh, strange sort of comments about the, the virus vis-a-vis -vis the Islamic religion versus others. Um, you know, it was very poorly handled and the president just refused to accept the need for lockdown measures. I mean, of course, many governments being concerned about the huge economic costs of bringing their economies to a halt. And I think that's, we've seen that globally, the tension between governments who, who want to keep the economies going and at the same time look after their uh, general public. Um, so I think generally Southeast Asia will emerge from this with the view that uh, they handled it reasonably well. They were also fortunate. You didn't have high death rates. Hospitals have generally not been overwhelmed. I mean, possibly they are beginning to be so in Indonesia, but uh, health services um, have, have generally coped. Um, so I think generally Southeast Asia will emerge uh, with a, a relatively uh, good record. Anybody else wanna add, add to that? Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, 
We have a question uh, from Virgil Martinez, and I think this is probably for Ben. Um, how do you think Japanese culture affected the way they handled the pandemic? Uh, I know you talked a little bit about uh, comfort, comfort with mask wearing, those kinds of things, but if there's more that you might want to add to that. Um, it, it's, it's, again, there's a lot of controversy over why uh, Japan has been as successful as it has, but it's, it's not, its success is not unique to the region. Um, and I, I don't think there are any factors necessarily unique to Japan that has have made it successful. I think, you know, if you look at South Korea, if you look at Singapore, Vietnam, Thailand, China, Taiwan, the list goes on. Uh, many countries have actually had uh, more successful uh, interventions. Um, I, uh, the government here does seem to think that there's something, uh, they have sort of some extent and sort of ethno-nationalist take on it. Uh, they refer to Japanese mindo, which is kind of like the quality of the Japanese people as being important. And I think there is some truth to that in the sense that um, people here, I, I think rather than the government policies necessarily being um, what's responsible, my impression is that people have been very good about, again, wearing the masks, uh, voluntary social distancing, et cetera. But I don't think that as I said, that's unique to Japan. I think that um, maybe it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I don't want to make any judgments about uh, cultures, you know, relative to each other. But maybe in the United States and uh, in Europe, people are not as willing to uh, sort of follow the request of the government for whatever reason, whether that's a cultural thing or it has to do with trust in government. I, I don't know. Um, I will say that the trust in government here in Japan is been surprisingly low through this. Um, the Japanese people's like assessment of Japanese government policies has been among among the worst of uh, anywhere in the world. Um, their judgment of how the, the Abe administration has handled this outbreak has, has been across the board very poor. Although I think people have been willing to uh, accept uh, scientific guidance from, from the government, uh, even though they question a lot of the political decisions that have been made. Right. So while, while we're talking about Japan, uh, we have a question from Danielle um, Salaz, uh, also for Ben, about um, whether or not there's been discussion in Tokyo about hosting the Olympics next summer. Um, mm -hmm. And is that going on? Yeah. Um, uh, what are people saying about that? So they're still, as of today, planning to host the Olympics next summer. Uh, they will be the 2020 Olympics. <laughs> they, they haven't changed the name. I think that's, that's a good thing, at least because it means they won't have to make new merchandise. Um, you know, it's hard to know whether it's realistic or not. If, if things continue the way they are, I, I don't really see how it's going to be possible. Um, as it is, no one can enter the country essentially uh, at all, uh, anyone who's not Japanese. And, uh, you know, short of a virus or some other kind of miraculous development, uh, it's just hard to imagine how it will pr proceed. Uh, Tokyo has said they want to simplify the Olympics. Uh, it's not really clear what that means. Uh, the Olympic Committee has also said that uh, they may try to do something like that. And um, I assume, although again, they haven't been explicit, that might involve uh, fewer spectators, that kind of thing. But as of today, there haven't been any decisions made, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on there being Olympics next year. Um, yeah. Uh, Haider Khan, who's a, a professor here at the uh, University of Denver, um, here in Denver, he, he asks a, kind of a, a, another question about Japan. Um, uh, he mentions his wife who's Japanese and just came back from Japan um, and drew his attention to a, a piece in The Economist uh, recently that ranked the 21 OECD countries in which neither Japan nor the US is listed as very effective. Um, but Japan is ranked lower than France and the US. Um, so there was some puzzlement about that ranking and whether or not uh, what, what might explain the uh, the economist's uh, intelligence uh, ranking of the U.S. and France on being more effective in fighting COVID-19 than Japan. Uh, I saw that as well and was also puzzled by it. it objectively, Japan has performed better than either on virtually every measure than uh, the U.S. or uh, France. Um, I, I, I don't know how to explain it other than I, I, I don't want to <laughs> speculate about what might have gone into making that assessment, but I, I just let's just say I don't think it was objective. Okay. Um, 
Um, yeah, we have another question for, for Ben, but I think um, I will follow, I'll, I'll skip that one for the moment, just, just so we move around. Um, we have about 10 more minutes or so, and I just wanna make sure and get through um, as many panelists and as many of these um, mm. as, as we can. Um, we do have a question for uh, Jinwan um, from Lillian Posh, who's, who asked, so given the estimates that North Korea may be suffering from COVID, why do you suppose they chose this time to escalate tension with South Korea? Um, aren't they already in a precarious situation? Yeah, right. Um, they are always a precarious situation. I mean, things keep changing a lot. I mean, if you think back in two years, years ago, there's like a summit meeting between South and North Korea. It's really good mood. And soon after that, there's another summit meeting between the U.S. And, and, and North Korea in Singapore. And if you think that time, I mean, around this time, it's totally different. And I think um, so whenever the, there's a tension between the U.S. and China, it is indirectly reflected in Korean peninsula in whatever ways, in many different, different forms. And I think uh, this kind of uh, North Korea is blowing up a building recently. They, they officially say that um, their reason for doing that is not really related with this, this uh, whatever tension things, but they just blame South Korea for like, keep sending some propaganda leaflets in a, in a balloon and things like this. But in a broader stance, I think um, the, um, what they think is that uh, the tension is growing between US and China and uh, that the Trump recently mentioned that they're gonna reduce the number of German troops in of the US uh, troops in Germany uh, a lot of uh, significant numbers and they may, it might happen in, in South Korea and those things. So there has been kind of a, some formula or some wisdom that uh, security wise uh, we seek alliance with the US and while maintaining this uh, economic um, the, the ties with, with China. But that kind of uh, the power balance is, is, is breaking up and, and it seems that North Korea is uh, trying to take advantage of that and sending some message to the outside the world. So I think that what they're doing, they believe, I think they believe that, that, that their benefit of doing that may be uh, bigger than the, the cost of losing this kind of, a, from this economic things from COVID-19. I mean, I mean, I'm not an expert in North Korea and it's just very precarious and unpredictable country. So I don't really know, it's my personal opinion. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see. It, it's interesting, Jinwon, that you mentioned, you know, the, the North-South North relationship being very much tied to the relationship between the U.S. and, and China. Um, and I think that's very true for so much of East and Southeast Asia more broadly. It's obviously been true with Taiwan and Hong Kong, but I think we could also say it's it's in many ways true of Singapore and, and other parts of Southeast Asia. And, and you know, if anything, the, the pandemic has worsened an already deteriorating relationship between U.S. and China. And that has certainly had um, significant impact across across the whole region in many many different ways. So I think that's a really important observation to always um, to keep in mind. Um, let's continue. We we have another a question from Haider, um also about South Korea, Jinwon. So let's continue um, on that thread. Uh, he asks, does the does the Korean interface among technology, state policies, civil society institutions, and the East Asian um, uh, as opposed to the Anglo-American market model, have some explanatory force in explaining Korea's performance in this crisis? Um, this, I think it's related with uh, the previous question and also Michael, the answer means kind of trust and it's a, whether it's a country is a comply to the, uh, the government the regulation or not. I mean, Korea company, I mean, is comply to the government regulation. I mean, from the, from the past, since there's a development of state, the government is quite strong and uh, we're supposed to follow this government regulation. But more important thing, I think, for this, this performance in this crisis is the people's agreements. These, mm. I, I called it an invisible agreement or consensus to, to follow this regulation, to, to um, open my data to their business like this. So that, that's something that we learned uh, in, in the previous epidemic like a SARS and a MERS, especially the five years ago that the MERS epidemic was quite a serious in this country. So it's a lot of uh, trial and errors going on at that. Since that time, we uh, government tried to make a one agency specifically for this uh, tracing and testing things. And now I think this is working, but still it's very unique uh, in this country's case in the East Asia, the Asia is whole very diverse region. So it's, it's quite hard to, 
to tell that to other countries. But at least in South Korea, I think that's what is one one reason for this performance. Great. Okay, um, we have about four or five five more minutes or so. We still we have a couple questions. I think we should be able to get through them. So let's. Um, we have a question from Robin for Ben. Um, is there any indication that the Japanese government will relax travel restrictions for foreign spouses of Japanese citizens? Um, uh, the, the current inflexible stance seems to reinforce Japan's image as a closed country, um, in some cases physically separating married couples due to these restrictions. Uh, sorry about that. Um, Anecdotally, I can say that uh, friends who have who are Japanese and have foreign spouses have been able to bring their their spouses into the country. Um, and this is sort of a personal issue for me because my wife is is trapped in in Washington D.C. Uh, and uh, she is French and unable to travel to Japan for who knows how long. Um, and I think that there is a, sort of a general concern that. Um, this pandemic has sort of intensified uh, to some extent a tendency towards political tendency towards isolationism in Japan. Um, the logic of uh, stopping people from certain countries from entering Japan is, is difficult to see. Uh, just now they're starting to talk about uh, opening the country to certain travelers from New Zealand, Australia, Thailand, and Vietnam. Uh, all of which have fewer cases than Japan. Um, and even when that happens, I think only very few people will be allowed into the country. It, it's hard to know when, um, when, when Japan will be willing to reopen to, uh, you know, um, other, other folks. And it has caused a lot of problems, primarily for people who are foreigners, uh, foreign residents of Japan, who can't leave the country for various reasons. Um, business people who can't leave uh you know um there are a lot of situations obviously uh, particularly during this pandemic where people had family members get become sick and they have to choose between decide between leaving japan and potentially losing their job uh, or seeing a, a dying family member and you know that that is um obviously a, a real problem so um hasn't been much progress but hopefully that will change in the coming months Thanks for that, Ben. Um, we have a question from Thomas Show about uh, how will COVID affect Asian translation localization industry? Um, and personally, I'm, I'm not exactly clear on what that mm. is referring to. Do our panelists have any insight on that? Not really. <laughs> I would. And I guess there's there's more streaming services now. People are watching more streaming television, so I know that there are oh, more that's true. translations of uh, uh. <laughs> Japanese television shows, at least on Netflix. I've noticed. Hmm. On that, I. Yeah, that's a good point because these days, if you look at Netflix and other streaming platforms, and then you see you start seeing more, let's say, non-English shows and then so a lot of the kind of a localization but not only let's say from non-english english language to english but but also the other way around so yeah assuming it's a bigger market now okay um and i think we have all the questions we do have one that said there was one from lauren yap but i haven't seen it it's in the answered Oh, is it? Yeah, it's oh, in the answered. Oh, and it was answered. Okay. Okay, so um, hopefully, I think all our uh, attendees can also see the answered questions. Um, and if not, the uh, transcript um, and all the answers to the questions will be available in our um, in re in the recording um, as well. So let me just uh, bring this to a close then uh, by first of all, thanking all our audience and attendees for, um, for attending uh, from all corners of the country and, and other parts of the world. Um, and hopefully, as I said, uh, we would like to do a, um, uh, another of these focusing on other parts of Asia later in the summer. So keep an eye out for uh, news about that when we get that organized. Um, 
And but, but otherwise, please join me in thanking our panelists, Michael, Yang, Ben, and Jin Wan for all for getting up early in the morning um, <laughs> and joining us from <laughs> different parts of Asia. We really, we really appreciate your insights and um, and stay in touch. And we will be hopefully doing more of these in the future. So with that, I will um, I will end the uh, session officially. And thank you all again. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.